Welcome back. Lucky number episode 13. Is it lucky? I, I, I don't know. I feel lucky. I feel lucky too, Grant. Right. And we are very lucky today to be joined by a hell of a guest. She is the official reporter of the Seattle Kraken for Root Sports, Piper Shaw. Piper, I know you're busy. I know you're often being asked to do different things, but thank you so much for carving some time out of your day to come join me on Signals from the Deep. I am so excited to be here. Thanks for asking me, you guys. We uh, have a lot to get through, but as I often do with our guests, which have hockey backgrounds and a passion for the game, I want to start off by talking and asking about your start in hockey. Where does your passion come from? What was your start? So my start in the broadcasting business is different than my start in terms of my love for the game. I grew yeah, up let's in, start there. yeah, I, I grew up in St. Cloud, Minnesota, mm -hmm. which if folks are not familiar with that town, there's basically two things there. And that is hockey and college hockey and everyone there plays hockey and a university mm -hmm. there. That's essentially what is in St. Cloud. So kind of the only thing to do in the town I grew up in is go to hockey games. So all my friends played hockey, you know, after um, when I was in middle school, we'd go to high school varsity football games and then we'd go back to my friend's backyard rink and play boot hockey, you know, yeah. play play some shinny hockey, mm. one could say. Um, and so that's kind of where it just started. It's just like, a, it's just a way of life where I'm from essentially. Um, but then I really started learning and learning more about the game when I started dating my now husband mm -hmm. because he played hockey. So I always I always watched wild games on TV. I went to um, several games when I was in high school and stuff like that. But it's it's almost a two hour excursion mm -hmm. from where I'm from to get to the Twin Cities um, right. to go catch a NHL game. Mm -hmm. um, so I just started learning more about it then. And then I went to college at St. Cloud State University where essentially that university is all about essentially broadcasting. Mm -hmm and hockey. That's the main things happening there. So it was a perfect mix to get experience in all kinds of broadcasting things, but specifically in hockey. And they have like phenomenal studios and stuff there. So I was able to uh, just dig into the game more. And because of the access that we got to the team and the athletes and stuff too, I think that really helped color my perspective of the game more from a professional standpoint, rather than just kind of growing up in it being part of the society that I was in, if that right. makes sense. And and growing up in it and doing some of the research that I did, um, I had read that you had a lot of nights at the Herb Brooks National Hockey Center watching the games, yeah. which is where St. Cloud State University plays. Um, going to games, what do you look back in the nostalgia? If you could look at your younger self and see yourself in the arena watching the game what do you feel oh uh, yeah a hundred percent i love that you found that note because that is so true to who i was as a hockey fan and still who i am but it's a different way of life obviously in the nhl than like in small town college hockey and with a diehard fan base st cloud state also has obviously a phenomenal college hockey team and has for a long time i remember in seventh grade me and my best friend uh, her name's maddie they had season tickets to the huskies and so uh, we were we were at every game on like Friday nights and her dream, I remember her telling me, my dream is to be a Husky ice girl. <laughs> 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 Which is funny when you say it now, yeah. but it's just like the, like the girl cheerleaders and she did figure skating. Mm. Um, and then like my, me and my husband's first date was to a St. Cloud State hockey game. Wow. And that was most of our dates it ended up being like going to hockey games all the time. So, and then, it, and then we went to college and then that became our jobs as well. And then we got paid to start working at these hockey games in this building that we grew up in. Um, there's a lot of players that I love keeping tabs on in the NHL, like Nick Dowd. Um, he actually married a girl I went to high school with and wow. they've been together for a long time. But like there's, I mean, Will Borgen, I went to college with Will Borgen. Mm -hmm. So it's so cool to see some of these people um, and just keep keep little tabs on them in their careers. I always watch mm -hmm. Charlie Lindgren. I, I was never like a Caps fan, but because they ended up with several St. Cloud State mm -hmm. players for several years and they still have a handful of them. They got Nick right. Jensen and Charlie and Nick Dowd, all that I just mentioned. I used to kind of follow them particularly in addition to the Wild just because I it's just when you have those player connections. So for a lot of people, that's NHL players. And there were a few Minnesota Wild players that I loved as well. But for me, mm -hmm. it was more about college hockey. 
when you did go to St. Cloud State University, I had also read that you went to college a year early mm -hmm. and you eventually double majored, not a single major. And for the record, I did not get a single major because I left college after <laughs> year number two, but a double major in broadcast journalism and communications. But you didn't stop there. Also a minor, not a minor penalty, but a minor in marketing. So take me through what life was like as a student at St. Cloud State University um, with those majors and the minor in mind, um, the path to get there, and what was the overall experience that helped shape you into the broadcaster that you are today? Yeah, so I was a speech kid <laughs> growing up, and so I knew I loved speech and debate. So when I was looking at careers that I could um, potentially have one day, I was like, what can I do that's about researching and writing and public speaking and listening and kind of talking with people and current events and broadcasting, broadcast journalism seemed like the obvious path for that kind of a thing. So I knew what I wanted to do, and I had the grades to go to college a year early, and there was a program I think people in Washington think it's similar to Running Start, which is what they have in Washington. But I think it's a little bit different because I was like a full-time college student. Like I did not have to do anything at my school at all my senior year of high school other than show up on my graduation day, which I also wouldn't have had to do. I just did that. Yeah. And everyone I went to high school was like, you still go here? Like we thought you moved. Like no one knew what happened to me. It must be nice. So, so I started college technically when I was 16 because I have an August birthday. So because of that, I took as many credits as I physically could that senior year of high school slash freshman year of college because I also knew that I was going to be paying for my school and it was free at the time. So I literally took as many. I was taking 21 credit semesters just so wow. I could take as much as I could while it was free. Um, and then I knew what I was doing. So I joined the television program right away. I knew that that's what I wanted to do. But then I got myself into a situation where I was 19 years old mm -hmm. and ready to graduate with a single major. And I did not feel emotionally mature. I was like, who's going to hire me? Mm -hmm. Who's going to hire me? I'm 19. <laughs> like, I've got no life skills. Like, <laughs> This is not the move. Also, I was still dating my boyfriend, who's now my husband, only boyfriend I ever had. And he was a normal person who graduated high school at 18 years old. So that was when he was just looking at going to college. Mm -hmm. um, so he ended up he ended up joining me, sacrificing some other opportunities that he had. Oh, wow. so True then, love. So then True I love. was like, all right, well, I'm going to have to justify sticking around a little bit longer. So he graduated college with a major and a minor in two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And he was taking 21 credit semesters and summer school every single summer so that he could catch up with me. And then I took another major. Right. So I ended up, we, we graduated in December of 2017, but Jake graduated high school in 2015. And I technically graduated high school in 2014, mm -hmm. if that kind of makes sense. So it's kind of a condensed timeline. So partially wow. I have a lot of stuff on my education just cause I had to keep, <laughs> I was trying to prolong it a little yeah. bit after I went too quickly. Mm -hmm. So. And the, Work ethic, the 21 credits, where does that work ethic come from for you? Um, for me, I think it just comes from, this sounds really dramatic, but just like wanting to be independent and like survive on my own, which sounds awful, but I had a really difficult childhood. And for me, the day that I was like set free from my family and my life, I was like, now I have the autonomy to actually do what I want to do and I was not going to fail. So for me, I don't want to say it's out of spite because it's not out of spite. It's more just that like now I'm on my own, which means I'm on my own and I'm going to crush this. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I think, what's governed me my whole adult life essentially since then. So yeah, 21 credit semesters. I was always a good student though. I mean, I got into college early and stuff. So school was not hard for me, especially when I was taking classes on broadcasting that I right. loved and so it wasn't, I wasn't taking a bunch of like hardcore math or anything, you know, I was taking <laughs> stuff that I'm interested in. Yeah. So, and I had the privilege to do that too, because then once I was kind of just taking more and more classes, I was mm -hmm. mostly only taking things that were higher level and things I was genuinely interested in. So right. even like business law, when mm -hmm. I had to take that, I still thought it was really interesting and enjoyed it. So, so those like broadcast journalism classes for you, um, what, what, what did that look like? Cause I, I never took one. Um, where I went to school at Colorado College, go Tigers. Grant, go Tigers. Go Pioneers. 
Um, <laughs> all in the same conference, by the way. Yeah, National the College best, Hockey Conference. In my opinion, the best college hockey conference, the NCHC. A lot of national Absolutely. champions come Absolutely. out of there. Absolutely. Um, but I'm just I'm just curious as someone who never had the opportunity to because they didn't even have a, a communications department at CC. Um, what uh, what was like a, a broadcast journalism class like, and maybe just like what was like the final project or something along those lines? Yeah, so I think it would depend based on the school because mm -hmm. St. Cloud State University, like they legitimately are one of the best broadcasting schools yeah. in the country. I mean, like the whole Fox Sports North staff, or now it's all Bally Sports. My bad, my bad. They're like almost all St. Cloud State grads. <laughs> yeah, it's um like Matt Gangle, the producer for the World Series. Of, actually, I think he's the director of the World Series and has been for like 10 years. Like he's from there. So they have they have like a $6 million studio, five control rooms, a whole green screen set. Like they have everything that you could ever need. So it depends on the class. Mm -hmm. But the like reporting classes, like the on-camera classes, they're taught by adjunct professors. So most of them, most of the producing and reporting classes are taught by um, anchors and people in the Twin Cities. So like we had Reg Chapman, who's like an iconic re news reporter and anchor mm -hmm. at WCCO, teach some of the classes. John Lauritsen, um, we had all kinds of people like teach those classes. So anyways, but the class that I got the most out of was definitely my reporting classes that Reg taught. And he would have us legitimately do like fake live shot scenarios. Like he would have us draw out of a hat, out of a hat prompts of something that's happening. And he would go give us two minutes in the hallway to prepare how, like with the bullet points of the information to prepare, stand in front of our whole class mm -hmm. and give that live shot report. But his point was, if you can't do that, you can't do this job. If yeah. you, and it's, and it's, it's a learning grounds, but it's like, if it makes you uncomfortable to do this and need to get it and also get it right, mm -hmm. that was always important. So it was a lot of those kind of exercises. Um, a lot of it was kind of based around news, but the skills are the same. So he would send us out like, He'd be like, you have 45 minutes to turn this package and you need to go get a man on the street interview on campus. And, and we, they were night classes. So we'd just go out on campus <laughs> with these 4K cameras and go shoot interviews wow. and come back and have to have it edited and then front it in front of the class again, if yeah. that makes sense. But they also did, at the time I was there, three newscasts every day, completely live, completely student talent produced, student gra graphics, student audio, everything. So that was also part of it was when you were in the reporting classes, you had to have a crew day to be also doing a crew position. So that was audio, replay, graphics, um, camera, whatever it may be. And then you also would have the opportunity to audition for an anchor spot if you wanted as well. Right. But the anchor spots were, there's only five days of the week that they did newscasts. So there's only just 10 spots mm -hmm. essentially. So, so, anyway. so when you're going through this, you know, your broadcast major and everything like that. Are you going through with the mindset that I'm going to get into hockey or I'm going to get into sports or is it, I just want to be in broadcast journalism? Like what, where are you, are you looking at it from hockey is my ultimate goal? So I definitely wasn't at the time one, because it was so competitive. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in Minnesota and you're at a school that specifically specializes in broadcasting, but also hockey broadcasting mm -hmm, sure. and sports broadcasting. So it was highly competitive and like the peers that I went to college with, to be honest, I just like wasn't super in, I'm not a highly competitive person. <laughs> I don't know, like I'm just not. And so I just wasn't interested in the stress that that would bring to my relationships in college. And as I said before, like I had, I had a difficult childhood. I was not looking for any more stressful relationships <laughs> at all. I was just looking to like keep my head down, do my work, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. So I actually went the news path, but I did always want to do hockey. I just didn't want to be competing against like some of the people I went to college with is Katie Emmer, who's now Katie Storm, but she basically graduated. She was the host for the Philadelphia Flyers for like a year or two. Then she went back home. Um, and now she's at Valley Sports North. She's not in hockey, but she, I know she wants to be. It's really competitive <laughs> in Minnesota. All those hockey jobs are so hard to get. And then another gal I went to college with, Alexis Pearson. She's the play-by-play -play for the um, the new Minnesota professionals women's hockey team on Valley Sports North. She um, works with Kevin Gorg a lot at the horse racing track as well. Um, she's great. And then another gal, Kirsten Kroll. She's the in arena host for the Minnesota Wild. Like there was just a lot. And there's a yeah. whole bunch of other people there. So anyways, I went the news route because I also was very good on camera 
from a young age because of the experience that I had in speech and debate and in public speaking in general. Mm -hmm. So at the time I was, you know, 18 and kind of smug and I was like, I don't really need to compete. <laughs> I don't, I didn't feel I needed to. Confidence. And I didn't need to. Confidence. So I worked in local news for nine months and mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to switch into hockey and I was like, yep, yep I'm gonna take that right now. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> some, some of those stops along the way, um, Starting at NBC 15 in yeah. Madison. Mm -hmm. And then to Rush Media Company, Fox Sports Wisconsin, Root Sports. In each of those stops, I'm sure you've learned something about your career, about your life, about yourself. But when you kind of look back on the other spots that you've been, um, is there a spot that you look back and you're like, yeah, I learned a lot about myself there or that job in particular really forced me out of my comfort zone or taught me something that is helping me now? To, yes, I think all of them mm. did in different ways. I think that first job at NBC, uh, NBC New, NBC 15, that's mm -hmm. what it is. In I Madison, can't even remember Wisconsin, it now yeah, in Madison, yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah. That one, um, I learned a lot about myself, but I also learned a lot about the business in different ways and particularly about like the news business. And it made me, it kind of was the first time where I was like, I need to really think about like what I want beyond just like setting myself free from the chains of my family, essentially. I was like, okay, now, now I am on, actually on my own and can start thinking about an actual life to live, if that kind of makes sense. Like I always looked at like my job and my education as like tools to have my independence. And then once I had it, I had to kind of be like, okay, now what? Mm -hmm. And that is definitely when I realized that um, I didn't want a job that weighed on me emotionally as much as news did for sure. It was, and I worked at nights, so I was covering a lot of just like really tough things all the time. And that was really hard for me, um, just emotionally and at the time and being, you know, pretty young at the time too. I also realized <laughs> this is really sappy, but I also realized how much I love my husband and how much, and he was not my husband at the time, but how much his support was was so helpful and necessary for me to actually have this career that I wanted because it's you make no money when you start. I remember leaving a shift one day in local news where I covered an explosion, which was tragic and firefighters died and it was awful. And I'd worked like a 17 hour shift, vomiting out the side of a car at three in the morning when I finally got back to the news station at 7 a.m. and my, my news director said that I needed to be back at noon <laughs> and I drove home as like the sun is rising and yeah. I saw that Chick-fil-A was paying more per hour than I was making. <laughs> and I was, this is my realization. This is where yeah. I'm going. I was like, I think I would be happier just peacefully making chicken sandwiches <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be richer to be yeah. honest. So yeah. that's, that was kind of the turning point where I was like, okay, I need to like, like get real about this and really start to think about what I want. And I did that and then it worked out for me very quickly after shifting into those roles at Rush Media and Fox Sports Wisconsin covering hockey. Mm -hmm. So He's come up a few times, so I think it's important to talk about Jake, <laughs> your your husband. What has he meant to you uh, personally and in this context in, in your career? I think, you know, it's hard because I every time I kind of tell people, you know, you, I'm sure you get the same questions, Nick. There's a lot of young people who ask, oh, how did you get your start in broadcasting? What's your number one advice on broadcasting? And I was like, it's a grind to break into this business. Like, and I feel, and I have so many friends who are still in local news who really want to be in sports in different ways, or they're in local news sports and, and the pay is not good. It is a thankless job and you have to really love it. But I was like, I think because I had the support of my husband, not only financially when we were not even old enough to legally drink and living on our owns, but also just, just because we both had two jobs and having like a dual income household is very, very helpful, obviously, um, especially when you're not making any money. Mm. So that was helpful, but also just like the emotional support to have somebody actually like cheering me on for the first time in my life and being like, being like, no, I think you are good at this, or I think we should do this. And it became a we instead of an I. Um, very quickly and just in general thinking about life and nav navigating life with somebody that I know I trust and is in my corner has been the like and it's been just an undeniable boost in confidence for my life and I always think about like 
it's such a privilege to be have a partner that like genuinely has your back and everyone loves jake so <laughs> and he's a and he's a heck of a hockey player too. He, I recently he's a good hockey player. had the opportunity to coach uh, a charity game for the One Roof Foundation at Climate Pledge Arena, and uh, Jake was on the team I was coaching. He had a couple of block shots, had a couple of goals. So aside from being a great support, yeah, he's got a well. And he he loves the game too. Yeah. So like that was you know when I was first covering college hockey, like in my first covering hockey job we would sit and watch hockey a lot and like he would see the game in different ways that i did also because he played and so he'd be like well see but watch that play starts down there in the defensive so a lot of that view of how i have hockey too i've also gotten from him just from enjoying watching it at home uh and he he loves the nitty-gritty and like the breakdowns and stuff mm -hmm. so um that's been fun too for just us like growing as like in love with hockey as yeah. well and where you're at now with root sports how did you land this job like what was the process to join root and uh and what do you think about being there yeah so i knew after i'd been covering college hockey for fox sports wisconsin for a couple of years i knew that like i wanted to go to the nhl someday and um there was nothing really for me more in wisconsin i i loved madison wisconsin i loved all the people that i worked with but like there was just really no more for me like i'd kind of reached the peak that i could there um and so i started just kind of networking with NHL teams. But when they announced years ago, NHL coming to Seattle, it was just NHL to Seattle. I remember I told my boss at the time, I was like, I'm going to work for that hockey team that's coming to Seattle. And he was like, okay, good luck. <laughs> Have fun. I was like, well, I am. I remember Jake and I sitting on our couch during the pandemic, watching on Twitter, the live stream of the name reveal that it was gonna be the Kraken. We'd been posting stuff on social like forever. And my husband, Jake, he loves pirates, loves pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> we got so much pirate stuff around our house. So he was always like, it's gotta be the Kraken. It's gotta be the Kraken. And it was, and um, I'd already been sending like kind of some emails and stuff. I got connected with John Bradford, who is the executive producer at Root Sports. I also got connected with some folks at the Kraken, including Johnny Greco, who's no longer with the organization, Katie Townsend. And I, I had meetings like with people long before it had been even announced that Root Sports was going to be the partner, anything. And essentially, um, people across the board seemed to like me and want me. And so essentially the team and your sports just said move here and we will figure out what we're going to do with you we don't know exactly but we know you will work so that was so i moved to seattle and it worked out well because my husband's job was also uh they were really needing somebody in the pacific northwest as well so it was a great incentive both ways um so we just we moved here i hosted the expansion draft day one i remember being backstage and Cammie Granado was back there because Tony Granado used to be the head coach at Wisconsin Hockey when I was there. And she saw me and she's like, what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> we took a selfie. We sent it to Tony. He's mm -hmm. like, what? Because it was because I hadn't really announced anything yet. I saw Jordan Everly backstage, Chris Trigger backstage. I was like, oh, my gosh, we're here. Yeah. And it was just the best thing ever. So anyways, uh, I did a, for a while the first year I did a little bit of like the in arena hosting. And then I was doing reporting, too. Like I was doing both. But it was clear that TV was what I was more comfortable in and what I would be more useful in because I'm also a content producer. And so it was, that just seemed like the fit. So I produced Inside Crack and Hockey, which was something that Root needed. So that's just how I settled up. Mm -hmm. And you've done a uh, multitude of sports too. I have. Hockey, Mariners for baseball, Seattle Storm. Mm -hmm. What's that like to be part of, of different sports? It's really fun. So when I was in Wisconsin, I covered not only the hockey team, but I also covered all of the high school sports for mm. Fox Sports Wisconsin, which they do like all of them, all of their champions, boys and girls, all their championships on air. So I had done soccer, cross country, volleyball, football. I'd done a lot. So that was helpful just in terms of like, kind of like the sports knowledge and like the run of show for how those broadcast because of the different setups of the sports, obviously. It's been interesting though, because like basketball, I love basketball. That's kind of like my second choice um, sport. If I had a second choice sport, I just, I like that it's dynamic like hockey and that it just like has that continuous flow. But it's been so cool to cover a women, like a professional women's sport has been really, really cool 
for me and the Storm are such a like legacy team in the WNBA. And then they, you know, now they're in the new building. The first year I was with them was Sue Birds last year and they were in Climate Pledge Arena. So to get to see that connection kind of between my hockey world and all of that, so much fun. Mariners is interesting too, because they're such an established entity in Seattle as a sports team. And I absolutely think the Kraken are, are growing in that sense, but obviously the Mariners have been here for decades and decades. So it's interesting to see the how like the different fan bases and just kind of what's important to the different worlds, I guess, and also how that show varies from our hockey show. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's been it's been fun just to get a little taste and I kind of do different roles in all of them too, so like different experience in that sense as well. Mm -hmm. So you're you're the same in me in the sense that, you know, we moved here, got this job. Um and one thing that I was very uh kind of pleasantly surprised about when I started here at the Kraken was it's a, an organization full of transplants. There's very, <laughs> very few people that that are from here. Uh, so everybody's got their favorite teams. They're, you know, a lot of knowledge they bring back. Um, have you found it to be um, an easy transition because of that? Have you found it to be, you know, a little bit more difficult to kind of find your footing because it's just a little different than um, than home? I, I imagine it's very different from St. Cloud, but, but what has that been like for you to kind of work with a bunch of people who aren't from here? I think it's been fine, but I also lived in Wisconsin, like I said, mm -hmm. for several years, which is similar to Minnesota, but it was different. And I was, you know, working with people that knew nothing about Minnesota, you know, quite a bit, <laughs> frankly, because in sports in general, I do think a lot of people move for jobs. Right. Um, but my husband and I, we love the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. We love Seattle because it's so similar to Minnesota, except for different. Like right. it's a little bit more like there's a little bit more of that tech culture, a little more edgy, a little bit more modern, which is kind of more our vibe, but also it doesn't get freezing, freezing, freezing cold, right. Right. but it still has that nature aspect mm -hmm. in the water and all of that. So um, we've loved it in that sense, but also I, I love people. And I think that people who are different are so cool and interesting to talk to. Like I would rather talk to people who did not grow up like I did 10 times over just because I feel, everyone's experience is different, but I'm just like, sure. T like tell me about like what like what's the food like like where you live like how's this weather for you mm -hmm. like you know did you ever have traffic where you are because that is not going to be started on the traffic that you know so I don't, I don't know I think it's been great but it's just like it's I find it so colorful and that all those experiences that people bring just make everything richer you know there you go. Yeah. do you have a favorite place in Seattle that you like to go or spend time at or eat or adventure mm -hmm. around you know one of my favorite things i've discovered since moving to seattle are soup dumplings oh yeah yeah first time i went to din tai fong and i had a soup dumpling i was like where can i find these and i think i found every place in the city that has oh, yeah. them that i yeah. like so i love those and now because i travel with the team like i go around and i look and like um that like a lot of places don't have soup dumplings Zhao long bao specifically yeah. and um that's one of my favorite things that we have here. So you can find me at a soup dumpling spot That's often. Grant, what about you? Uh, you know what? The food has been something that is, um, it's been a huge change for me. Um, you know, coming from Colorado, Mexican food is is what I usually eat mm -hmm. and, and I really love it. Green chili is something that you can't get out here. Really can't get it outside of the kind of that Southwestern area. Mm -hmm. But my wife, who is from here, has turned me on to the myriad of um, not only seafood out here, but um, like you said, Asian food, mm -hmm. dumplings, and she's like, and teriyaki. Teriyaki is not a thing outside of the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. um, you can get it, but it's not the same. Right. And and to get like really good teriyaki, like when you're, I don't know, just a night in, you're gonna watch some movies mm -hmm. and have to have that is that's ultimate comfort food. Comfort yeah. food for me. So I recently discovered my favorite thing food wise and there's a lot of great food out here but one of our great fans brought a bag to us at a practice probably a couple of weeks ago and in this bag were three and maybe maybe four chocolate chip cookies from met market oh. called yeah. the cookie yeah oh yep. i know yep. what you're talking about that's like when you know it's really good it's just called the cookie and Enough everybody said. knows. Yeah. And since I ate that one or three from the bag, I have gone back to Met Market and, and gotten probably 
six ever since. But Having you, one of those before beds with a bed with a glass of milk just like it's like the greatest thing in the world for me. But that's your weakness. Your, I was going to say that's the most tooth. nickel check that yeah. I've ever heard. Weakness or my strength, Grant? <laughs> fair Which enough. One? Fair enough. See? But back to you, Piper. Um, I read something online that was pretty profound. And the quote goes something like this. Piper sees it as an absolute privilege to work with communities, teams, and athletes to share their stories, end quote. With that in mind, and your role very much being a storyteller, what is it about telling people stories that makes you so happy? I think it goes back to my response earlier to Grant about just like, I just think that all the experiences that people bring are what makes being human so awesome. People's stories have so much power. They have the power to inspire. They have the power to make you feel things that maybe are uncomfortable and make you grow a little bit or, you know, cause a little bit of friction as well that can make you uncomfortable, but that can be a good thing. They can show you that there are different paths, that there's always a way out, whatever it is. Like, I just think that stories are so powerful and that the more that we, I don't want to say like, sometimes I think we know too much about each other just in the world in general. (laughs) I do believe that, but I also think that those things are really what bind us as people, as communities, and like as human beings. I think that stories are legitimately one of the most powerful things that we have as mortal people on this planet, which sounds really dramatic, but that is truly what I believe. Right. And, and, and I know you've done a lot of reporting, a lot of storytelling, <laughs> but is there is there one or two or three that in your career you think back and the story that you told or what you were involved in had an effect on you? There's one in particular um, that, I, all, that I just think about a lot and that I've said before throughout the years. There was, there is a hockey player named Ty Pelton Bice. I believe he plays for the Manitoba Moose right now, or he did last year. I don't know if he still does. I'd have to check. But he was a Wisconsin hockey player when I was there, um, and he is the son of Brad Bice, who is like an iconic Wisconsin Badger, um, part of winning a national championship. He was born and raised in uh, in Madison, Wisconsin, and he actually went and played college hockey at Harvard. But he really struggled with his mental health while he was at Harvard really really struggled where he his grades ended up slipping so bad that he couldn't be on the team anymore he was getting invited to nhl training camps and one day he went back home before leaving for a san jose sharks training camp and his mom found him on the kitchen floor with shattered dishes all over the floor and he was just sobbing on the floor and she's like ty like what's wrong what's going on and he was supposed to be leaving that day to go to this nhl training camp and he was so mentally not in a good place that he couldn't and he ended up not being able to go to that camp or not going or going later something like that um but he ended up having to drop out of harvard he went to the madison area technical college to get his grades back up to a point just to be able to um try out for the wisconsin team so he had to go for like a year to get his eligibility back and to um, do all these things just to be able to try out for the wisconsin badger hockey team Then he did. He made the team. At this point, like, years have passed, basically. So he's, like, a little bit older than his teammates now. And he was a phenomenal hockey player. Like, and he got his, like, game back. And he owned his life. And he became, like, he spoke a lot to the team about, like, mental health and, like, just all these things. And because he was a little bit older, younger guys, like, for example, at the time, it was, like, Dylan Holloway who plays for the Oilers, Cole Mm -hmm. Caulfield. Like, they were on the team at the time. And he was, like, on the power play unit with them and, like, really shouldering them. And he was comfortable enough, which for hockey players, sharing something that vulnerable Mm -hmm. is a lot. But it meant so Mm -hmm. much to so many people in the community to see him thrive. And I think he's still playing pro hockey now. Um, But, like, I just think that story is amazing. Mm. Anyway. No, it's great. And to be able to bring those stories to light help a lot of people. So good on you for that, Piper. Earlier you talked, uh, you mentioned uh, traveling with the team. What What is that like? What What is life like on the road covering a National Hockey League team? It's a grind, but it's a good grind. Um, I think that being on the road 
in my role in particular helps a lot because when you are looking for those stories and when you're kind of keeping tabs on um, really all of the little things that are happening that kind of help color what we know is happening, um, being there and seeing what there is to be seen just by being on the road is very, very helpful. But it's also different because when we're home, a big part of my job are the scrums that we have pre pregame and post game. So um, a lot of times on the road, it's just me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have Jeff Baker from the Seattle Times and Kate Shefty from the Seattle Times, but oftentimes it can be just me. Sometimes we also have Bob or Allison, um, which is great. But it's very different versus when we're at home and there's like 15 people in the locker room all asking questions. So an important part of my role is making sure that we get answers to a lot of the big questions so that all of the people back home who need that information but also need that sound for local newscasts and for all those things have it if they need it. So my role ends up being a little bit different on the road versus at home. Also, from a broadcast standpoint, you never know the technology on the road and like the crew versus at home, we have a little bit more of a well-oiled machine as everybody does. You know, you kind of have your familiar faces who make sure that everything is working exactly how you need and all of that on the road. It's a little bit different. So and windier in the tunnels. Sometimes. Oh yeah. A little windier in the tunnels. Sometimes I'm like anyone, any chance we could find a chair, any, is that a possibility? Any chairs anywhere? Yeah. Getting into those tiny visiting <laughs> locker rooms with a bunch of camera cables is not fun. And mm -hmm. um, very, very big shout out to our wonderful equipment staff for always being patient while we're in their way, while they're trying to pack up so we can get <laughs> out of there. But yeah, I mean, it's a grind because we travel after the games usually. So, I mean, we're checking into some of these hotels, two, three in the morning, 3.30 in the morning. So it's kind of hard to like get your sleep schedule back. And then of course life goes on while I'm on the road at home. And so every time I get home, I'm like, okay, what's going on with this? I got to re just got to like reset, yeah. Yeah. but, um, but it's, it's great. It's a grind, but it's fun. And I think it's important. Is there, is there any city you kind of look forward to when you see it on the calendar? You're like, Oh, we're going, we're going here. And I mean, I know I'm going to have a good time. It's going to be an easy game. Um, or, or it's just a, a nice place to be for a couple of days. So, Yes and no. From a technical <laughs> standpoint, going to Edmonton is great because the crew there are awesome who I, who work with me and I've had different people, but just like everything for me at least is like always working exactly how I want and they like remember me because we go there quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So ev they're like, I never have any, any problems or questions or anything. Like it's just like smooth sailing from a technical broadcast standpoint. Sure, sure. Not my favorite place to go in February <laughs> when it's negative 15 degrees, obviously. Right, right. Um, so I think I kind of think it depends on the time of year. Mm -hmm. um, like, I like going places that are warm when sure. it's cold, yeah. obviously, but I, you know, that's kind yeah. of it. Arizona's fun because they're at the they're at Mullet Arena, right. so it's a little it's an alternative venue for a an little, NHL little team. Wild West, right? So now, it's a yeah. little <laughs> bit different, but it's still fun because the environment is very mm -hmm. different, and it's kind of something to look forward to, and mm -hmm. that it's a different kind of a journey. So, cool. how about uh, you're in a big city on an off day on the road? What 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 are you gonna do? To be honest, I never do anything, mm. and our great director Pat Brown always gives me a little bit of a hard time because I don't leave my room. <laughs> I don't, I sit in my room and usually I have like work to do or yeah. prep to do. And it's hard cause if we have an off day that usually means that we got home at three in the morning or that yeah. we got to that hotel at mm -hmm. three in the morning. So to be honest, I'm usually like sleeping till 11. I might go for a walk. Like I'll try to go to like, if it has a decent gym at the hotel we're at, I might try to like go for a walk or just like move my body a little bit. But mm -hmm. Otherwise, like I really don't. I play my Switch a lot. Me and JT both were like in our rooms playing video games. Hey, to, to, to each their own. And I feel like it's kind of your one way or another. You either want to hunker down and just do what you got to do, or you have the more adventurous people that just like can't wait to get there. And well, then when they get there, they're out of the room within eight seconds. The season's just such a grind. And with yeah. the travel that like I just find that like I have to conserve. Otherwise, if I'm doing stuff and I'm running like, you know, burning the midnight oil in a, in a sense, all the time when I'm on the road, I, it's just, it's not sustainable for me. Um, I'm also, I love like people and I know I have a, like a bubbly personality, but I am an introvert. Like my bubbly personality is allowed to come out when I have been socially rested enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have to be socially like yeah. rested, which sounds crazy. But when you're on the road, a lot of times it's like, you're constantly around people mm -hmm. all the time. So 
I like to just kind of hunker down a little well, what, bit. What games are you playing on your Switch? Uh, right now I'm playing Pikmin 2, and I'm <laughs> replaying it for the third time this season. <laughs> I love Pikmin. I play a lot of Mario Kart. The guys, actually, the, the team, they invited me to join their Mario Kart tournament on the mm. plane one Ooh. time, which was very, very nice. And um, you got first place. Well, okay, first of all, I did not. I did not. But <laughs> I didn't. I was confused because I'd never played online in that way, and I was playing on my account. I should have been playing on Jake's account because that's the account I normally play on so I could have the carts that I have and the characters and the maps that I have. I didn't have any of that unlocked on mine, but I thought that they would be confused if I logged in and it was Jake, and it was like the little (laughs) Nintendo me of Jake. So I thought it would be better if I logged in as me. Bad mistake. So anyways, I didn't have my build, and I didn't have all my stuff. They also play, like zero they play as fast as you can play Mm -hmm. so they're playing i think it's 250 cc is the fastest right yeah so they're playing the fastest that you can play they're playing like rainbow road like the hardest levels (laughs) you can play and they're playing with like zero of the other like controls and stuff so like Mm -hmm. with the drift and everything so i'm like i can't drift and they're like yep you can't i'm like what can't can't hide behind the help yeah i love it yeah so i did not do well and (laughs) and it was so sweet so it was vince dunn who invited me but he's like yeah i don't even play so he saw i had my switch out and i was playing pick me he's like do you want to play mario kart with the boys and i was like yeah i would love to yeah and so he goes back to the it was on the plane he goes into the back of the plane he brings up oliver bjork straight and oliver's like piper you want to join our mario kart tournament i was like i guess so so he's like okay i'll get you logged in. he's like let me go make the group so him and brian dumoulin are like making their little group and they're yeah. like okay oliver comes back up to my seat he's like you should be able to join now but i wasn't close enough to mm-hmm. them because i was in the middle of the plane they're all in the back mm-hmm. so then oliver Asked uh, team services, Brett and Baxadol, if I could move a couple chairs back so I could be close. It (laughs) was like a whole thing. But it was so nice. They all were like, they went out of their way to try to make sure that I could play with them. And then I played awful. It's okay. They they probably love that. You didn't have your build. Yeah, I explained that. I explained that. And then Maddie was like, okay, Piper. (laughs) Maddie Veneers. He was like, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Like, just trust me. Just trust me, bro. You know what to do for next time, I guess. Yeah, now I know. I explained it. They were like, mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the guys, um, we've kind of gotten an idea for life on the road, but how about a, take us through a typical game day at home for you from the morning skate until the second you walk back into your house after the game? Yeah, so usually I wake up around... 8 30 in the morning and usually i wake up drink a cup of coffee get myself decently presentable but i don't like to put a lot of work into that because later in the day i'm gonna have to do the whole tv makeup thing you know that's a whole thing so i don't want to spend a lot of time on that drive in the drive from my house to kci can be 15 minutes or can be 45 minutes so you just never really know um so i come to kci for morning skate obviously nick you and i all of us on the broadcast we watch morning skate we kind of look for any big notes if there's any clear line changes or maybe somebody is slotting in a different spot on the power play whatever it might be you just kind of look for those you know cues then we have media availability which is an important part of my role for a broadcast and for basically more purposes beyond myself to get that information gathered at home there's more people though like i said we go in the locker room, we talk to a player or two, whoever we think the storylines of the day kind of revolve around. So I'm sure, you know, at the time we are recording this, Jordan mm-hmm. Eberle's 1000th game is right is right here. Mm-hmm. So that is the kind of player we're going to go talk to about that, right? So it just kind of depends what the stories of the day are. Then we talk to Coach Dave Haxtall, um, get his kind of thoughts on the day. Then usually I would drive home. I will call our producer, Ryan Shaber, when I drive home to talk about um, what I kind of heard, what stood out to me. He'll kind of tell me what um, John Edzo, JT are thinking they'll talk about because usually I kind of get like the third tier thing or maybe a little more of a human interest story rather than an X's and O's story. It just kind of depends, you know, it just kind of depends on the day and the game at hand. Um, Sometimes we have a sound bite, sometimes we don't. Go home, I usually eat something really quick wash my face start putting all this freaking makeup on ridiculous Ridic- i complain about it all the time i complain about it all the time every time i'm putting blush on my face i'm like who cares about this not me but here i am <laughs> anyway uh it usually takes almost like two hours to get ready 
So then I usually try to leave my house around 3, 3.30 to drive back down to the arena because that can take 20 minutes or it can take an hour and a half. You mm -hmm. never know. And also during that afternoon, I prep as well. So whatever I'm talking about in the pregame show, I prep who, um, questions for whoever our bench interview is just kind of based on, um, you know, what I know you're going to be talking about, what I know Allison is talking about, just kind of the stories of the day. I try to wrap that into interviews as well, just to kind of keep it all cohesive as yeah. much as possible. And then I drive to the arena and we usually eat at the arena and mm. it's showtime. Yeah. Yeah. Was reporting always the goal? Yes, mm. always the goal. And honestly, I don't really have another goal. This is like, this is what I always wanted to do is basically exactly what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been doing it for that long and I feel I'm young enough where I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna try to ace this and like hone in on this at this point in my life. Cause hopefully life is long, you know, there's so much room and time for other things and other opportunities. And I'm sure someday I'll want, you know, a new challenge, but I feel like I still have room I can grow, mm -hmm. you know, in this skill set. Yeah. I know you mentioned earlier um, about people in the past having asked for advice that you might give. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna ask the same question because I, I think it's really important for people who, um, want to get into broadcasting they want to be like piper shaw um and nick olchek well i guess <laughs> i could probably count that on one hand so know, whatever or a couple of fingers but um w what is a piece of advice that 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 you would give to someone who wants to be involved and wants to become a broadcaster so first, I think it depends on their age mm -hmm. because I've had people who are, you know, 14, 15 years old ask me and I always say, um, join speech. I always say that. And I know that that's a weird kind of a thing, but I just think like, if you're not comfortable public speaking, if you're like, if, if the thought of being on the speech and debate team is so cringy to you, this is probably not a business for you. Mm -hmm because speech is literally all about public speaking, listening, researching. It's also about being critiqued. They literally rank you against your peers, one out of seven, and then give you a percent of how good you are. Like it's, it is so critical, but it's good because it gets you very comfortable with improving, wanting to get better, reflecting on how you've done on something, and also just the basic public speaking skills and being um, comfortable. So I always say speech. If you're already in college or maybe you've already graduated and you know, you're trying to break into the industry, I think there's two things. I think I always say like one, you have to be there for the right reasons. There's a lot of people trying to break into broadcasting who aren't there for the right reasons. It was always like a red flag to me when I was talking to someone who was like in news and then they're like, well, I really want to be on like E news. And I'm like, I get that, but you realize there's like four people, like there's four, which I'm not trying to like, um, you know, be a downer on your dreams. Mm -hmm. It's just like, like you need to think about this in a bigger picture here if that's an end goal, which is, I believe that truly people can do anything if they have the skills and the smarts to do it. But I'm like, okay, are you here for the right reasons? Like, right. are we here because we want to be pretty on TV or are we here because these skills and the work that it is are the actual like motivation, if that makes sense. So I always, that's always one thing, be there for the right reasons. And the next thing I also think is just like, be a good person, like prep, do your work and be a good teammate. Like, I just think I've worked with a lot of people in broadcasting who might be good on air, but they're not good people. Mm -hmm. Or it's not that they're not good people, but they're not good teammates. They're not truly supportive. They're not there for the end goal of the whole production being better. And so I always kind of say that too. The third thing is just networking. But yeah. the networking often comes naturally if you're approaching this as a people business mm -hmm. rather than a sports business in a sense. On March 8th, it was Women in Hockey Night against the Winnipeg Jets for the Seattle Kraken. What was that night like for you? And what was the, uh, what was the meaning behind it for you? I think that was a really, really fun night. Obviously, we've had a couple of them. Um, it's just also fun. Like I was every time I did an intermission interview, Lindsey Brown, one of the Kraken's great PR members, she, you know, she brings the player over and I was like, that was for women in hockey. And she's like, that's for women in hockey. So it was kind of just fun for like us girls to just like yeah. be silly, but celebratory mm -hmm. about it. Um, I also think it's really cool for all of the little girls in the building in particular. Nick, I know that you gave a puck to a little girl mm -hmm. when you had an, when you had that one from between the benches. Like, I think that just shining that light on women, it's, 
it's cool for us women who are already here, obviously, to be recognized, but I think it's more important for the next generation of girls and women seeing that spotlight, if that makes sense. Representation. Yeah, pr exactly. Pr pretty important. Absolutely. Yeah. On that note, what's your relationship with Allison Lucan? <laughs> well, we call it the experience. Mm -hmm. Hashtag the experience. Um, Allison has been a great mentor and friend to me. Um, especially because we come from such different worlds into this space. Our experience is so vastly different because she came from obviously an analytics background, but also from a print journalism background, which is not something that I ever had any experience in or really interest in because obviously I got into this business because I felt that the researching, the public speaking, all of that was where my skill set was. So I have a lot of knowledge about the broadcasting business and the ins and outs. I also think I failed to mention that my husband is a broadcast engineer, not unrelated with our broadcasts or anything I do at all, but he also works in TV. And so like, I have a lot of knowledge about like the technology and what goes into a production versus she had a lot more knowledge about like some X's and O's about hockey, but in a different way and with a different perspective. And she has more insight also on like hockey as a business because she was a print journalism cousin co covering like organi organizations. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm speaking too fast here. Okay. I'm just too excited. Um, so it's been interesting to have both of our experiences and like kind of compare notes because they're so different, but I've been able to learn so much from her in that sense. Um, also, she's just, it's just nice to have like, Another gal around, mm -hmm. Nick, love ya. It's just nice to have yeah. somebody else who I can complain about blush with, you know? So I yeah. don't wear blush. I mean, I wear- uh, You don't need to. I wear uh, some You're concealer from time to time. Yeah. Something to take away the shine. All the time, but You're so yeah. really We're all supposed to wear the, the powder for the, mm -hmm. the shine prevention, but yeah. um, I, I respect her so much. And um, also, there's obviously like a little bit of an age gap too. So there's just like some life things that I've learned from her that have been awesome as well. And I also think it goes both ways. I think that I've offered her some perspective too in different ways. The experience, where does that come from? Well. There's so gotta be a story behind there is. it. Okay. Last year when the Kraken did their favorite things baskets. So this was last season's um, for donations for, the, well, they were donated to the One Roof Foundation. Allison and I did a basket together. We just combined and did a bunch of favorite things. And Pat Brown, our great Kraken hockey director, retweeted it and he said, I live hashtag the Piper and Allison experience every day. And it was like <laughs> bit high and bit often or something. Yeah. He came up with it. Okay. And we're like, this is amazing. Because the basket included like a lunch with us and a tour of the Root Sports studio and stuff. So it had some like interpersonal interaction included mm -hmm. in it. So that's where it came from. And that's how, and then we just shortened it to the experience. Yeah. There you go. Everyone is very well familiar with it and you guys do an incredible job. Um, and when you guys are together or doing some stand up hits on the pregame show or whatnot, it's always, it's always fun and extremely informative. Um, how about um, idols of yours, people that you look up to in the business or in life, people that you have, people that you do now, um, people that have had uh, a great effect on you? Yeah, so people that I watched, going back to the representation about women, mm -hmm. two women that I watched when I was growing up who were on Fox Sports North at the time, Jamie Hirsch, who's now at NHL Network. Mm -hmm. I always really, really looked up to her, um, as well as Jenny Taft, who more does college football, um, but they both are Minnesota girls mm -hmm. and they got to go live their sports broadcasting dreams. And those are definitely the two that when I was growing up, like I was watching um, on the network and seeing maybe I could be like them. I feel I'm very different from both of them now, but those were people when I was quite young that I looked up to. Um, when I was in college, I really liked to listen to Joe Beninati because I was watching a lot of Caps games oh, when yeah. I was in college because I was, and he's been the voice of the Caps for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I've worked with him actually, I worked with him randomly on a lacrosse broadcast with Quint Kessenich in uh, New York. And so I went out there and I got to like meet them and it was really cool. So he's actually been a great mentor. I went, a mentor might be a little bit much, but like when I was still in college hockey, I'd send him my reels and he would send me notes. And he always has been a great supporter when we go to Washington or to DC, technically mm -hmm. <laughs> I get to, I go, I always go say hi. So I always yeah. really liked him. I also 
really enjoy Carlin Baith. And mm-hmm. now it's funny because now people kind of get us a little bit confused. Carlin Baith is basically me for the LA Kings, but mm-hmm. she's been there for over 10 years, I think. And she kind of worked her way up. Um, also in the NHL video game too. Yes, she is. Oh, and yeah. she, and we just have a very similar vibe. Like we both like video games and like Disney and we're just kind of like nerds, but we also love hockey and like leather jackets and just that kind of a vibe. So it's just funny because I used to watch her and she did like the digital content thing and that's what I was doing in Wisconsin. And I very much at the time looked at her as like, okay, there's obviously a space for exactly what I'm doing in college hockey Mm. in NHL hockey because it's already happening in a huge franchise. And I'm going to Disneyland with her in a couple of weeks. So (laughs) we're friends now. So is there, is there something kind of to expand on this? Is there something like a bucket list item that, either you have done or have yet to do in your career that you're looking forward to or or you can tell us about? Honestly, one of the things that was absolutely a bucket list item for me, I got to do this year alongside Nick and the great John Forsland, which was work a winter classic. Oh, I got to work yeah. the Sports USA national broadcast with the two of them. Um, shout out Larry Kahn. Yeah, shout out Larry <laughs> Kahn. Also shout out John for, you know, including me in that. So um, that was absolutely a huge thing a huge bucket list item for me in Minnesota. We have a thing called hockey day, Minnesota, which is almost my favorite. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's It's such a production. And when I was in college, we hosted it in St. Cloud. And so it was just like a whole, and it was literally on the lake that my high school is built on. Cause you know, in Minnesota, you just play boot hockey and gym class Mm because your high school's on a lake. Cause Mm -hmm. that's what happens in Minnesota. (laughs) (laughs) So we got to like go out there. So that was so cool. But that really made me like, think about how cool it would be to do an NHL version of that, which basically is the winter classic. Um, so yeah, that was absolutely a bucket list item for me. It was really cool. Also to get to do it in Seattle with Mm, our team and it was so cool. Pretty special. So special. Before we delve into, uh, some hockey talk, um, well, it's cracking hockey talk. Um, you've got a very incredible love for music. Where did that start? And how important has music been to your life? That started very young. My dad was a musician when I was growing up, among other things. So I grew up going to a lot of his concerts in the Twin Cities at the Kitty Cat Club, the Quest, First Ave. Wait, Kit Cat Club? The Kitty Cat Club. Oh, it was a club in, I got hungry in there Minneapolis for a that I think recently uh, got closed down, actually. Mm. I think the pandemic may have ended it uh as well as like the quest so i grew up going to his shows he was in an electro punk band there's some pretty incredible pictures of him online we had a recording studio in our basement so i had a guitar from when i was like six years old i didn't really play it very much but um i did like theater a little bit and like i love to sing but i grew up listening to punk rock music like goldfinger less than jake anti-flag New like glory yeah newfound glory that's a little more in the pop punk but mm, yes yeah. still definitely there um like the Misfits, Pennywise, like all these bands. So um, I very much grew up like with that kind of music being, and also music as a form of voice and like as, as of agency, that's the kind of music that I listen to, not just for vibes, but for like the storytelling. So that's why it became so important to me was because I listened to it for the stories, for the words from a young age. Then I wanted to start writing my own stories into music and so, I actually played the drums. That's the first instrument I played. It started in the fifth grade because I had rhythm because I listened to music and rock music my whole life. So th- my band teacher was basically like, you actually have to be the drummer because you're the only one. <laughs> but then my, my dad was like, well, like female drummers are BA. So he always thought it was so cool. So he's like, yeah, you got to be the drummer. But then I wanted to write music. So I had to learn how to play the guitar. So I do play the guitar and I know a little bit of music theory enough to like play the piano to produce things um, in my room. But yeah, I write music all the time. When I come home from cracking games, usually I'm too wired. So I just pick up my guitar and I write things. I have a couple songs on Spotify. It's not like a serious thing for me. It's just like something that I like to do and another creative outlet. And it's just fun. It's just like a hobby. Well, you do great and you sound great. So whatever <laughs> you're doing, keep doing it, Piper. Um, as we turn now to talk about the uh, about the Kraken this year, um, I know it's a very broad question, but in, it's meant intentionally. Uh, what have just been your thoughts on the season overall uh, for the team coming off of what was an incredible year last year? It's been some great things to happen this year. Um, some tough stretches for the team as well. 
Um, but what have just kind of been your thoughts on the overall year this year for the Kraken? I think that with how well they've been playing now and the kind of efforts that we've really seen these last couple of weeks and these last couple of months, it just makes it feel personally like a little bit more of a bummer that the beginning of the season was so tough because had the beginning of the season gone just a little bit better, we wouldn't be in as tight of a race as we are now, but that's okay. We also had some big, we had some pretty big changes in the off season. You know, the team does look different than it did last year. Um, I think that it's been nice to see a little bit more of a return to that depth scoring, but obviously that was such a core part Mm -hmm. of their success, of their identity last year. Um, But I think we're really starting to see kind of that identity return more and more. And we have over the course of the last couple of weeks. So, um, but it's been really fun. It's been really fun, particularly to see Riker Evans get in the mix and how good he's been, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like, I've really enjoyed that part of the season. Seeing Joey Decord's star shine like it has has been so much fun because it was always so exciting, you know, last year or, or, and even the first year when he get called up to play, like, one game. And, you know, it's like, oh, but look what he could do. And you're keeping tabs of how he's just crushing it in the AHL. And you're like, it doesn't seem like – he could get any better at the AHL level, right? Yeah. So that's been so awesome. And a and pretty then, good interview, too. He, and he is, is a good right? interview, and he's quite the character, mm-hmm. obviously. Goalies do tend to be, as you know. Interesting. You know? Yeah, goalies tend to bring a little a little bit, I don't want to say more personality, because that's not always the case. They just sometimes have a little more of a unique right. character to yeah. them, just a little bit. Yeah. Um, and obviously it was a bummer to see, you know, Philip Grubauer go out injured. But for him to come back and play as well as he has it's since then, I mean – unbelievable mm-hmm. you know so it's been good to see overall um yeah that's that's kind of my overall my big picture yeah. take as we record this on uh monday march 11th mm-hmm. just want to make sure grant uh, these check th- on the calendar these, yes <laughs> these days are uh, blending together at this point in the season um the kraken are currently eight points out of a playoff spot chasing the Vegas Golden Knights who are holding the second wild card spot, playing the Knights tomorrow on Tuesday. Thoughts on that game and how the jockeying for position has been. The Nashville Predators just won't lose. They keep winning. Vegas absolutely, and I mean every letter of absolutely, loaded up at the deadline in (laughs) terms of some of the trades that they made. And also knowing that, well, the Kraken with 67 points right now are tied with the Flames and the Blues, but are above them in terms of the tiebreakers, but still looking to jump over the Minnesota Wild. So mm-hmm. I know that's a lot, but mm-hmm. the importance of the game coming up against the Golden Knights to you is what? So important. It's also, on top of all of that, Jordan Eberle's 1,000th game, mm. which I think can fare well for the Kraken. I think that especially after getting that contract done, I have a feeling Jordan is going to come out on all cylinders, and I have a feeling that the guys will for him as well. That's my hope. Um, but the significance of that game cannot be understated. Also, as we know, you know, oftentimes the Kraken organization gets compared to Vegas, even though they are so different, so different in so many ways. But I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of people watching that game, not only to see Vegas and them, you know, load up and it's in Climate Pledge Arena, but it's also Jordan Eberle's 1000th game. So that is, that's a big one for like the cultural NHL moment, I feel, but also for the Kraken in the standings, it's a big one. Um, I, you know, I will say that even if, they don't end up winning that they're still not out of it because Mm -hmm. as you pointed out there's so many other moving parts to this playoff race right now the only thing that they can do is focus on winning as many points as they Mm -hmm. can and even and even if they do that just based on what all the other teams do too we'll just have to wait and see you know but Mm -hmm. that makes it fun we're playing meaningful hockey in march which is every nhl team's Mm -hmm. goal at this time of year and the kraken are doing that so Fingers crossed. Mm-hmm. We'll see. That's what you're looking for, playing important hockey this time of year. So you you mentioned trade deadline, mm-hmm. you know, craziness from Vegas. Um, kind of the opposite with the Kraken. Obviously, you know, Eberle gets his, his contract extension, which is great. I think everybody wanted to see that. Uh, Wenberg leaving, though, uh, is that going to have what you consider a major impact, especially with not any – any names coming in, um, what is that going to look like for the rest of the season without uh, without Winberg? 
It's a good question, especially because Wenberg carried a lot of defensive responsibility for mm -hmm. this team and played on both special teams. Mm -hmm. He is a very interesting player in his skill set in that way. I think that's hard to replace, but I do think that the Kraken have enough people who also do those things and do those things sure. well. It's just not that it's like one person who does all of those things. So I think that, you know, they've had Jared McCann playing down the center. He's well aware that that playing down the middle at center, that, mm -hmm. um, that requires some more defensive responsibility, but I think he's handled it quite well, and they've mm -hmm. put him in that spot a couple times throughout the season as well. So it's just gonna—it just means other guys have to step up in different ways. But I think that they have all that they need to do that. I also think um, what's a little bit tricky about it too is obviously everybody's talking about you know someday Shane Wright's gonna need a spot. Right. They're gonna need a right. spot for him at center and all those things. So it's probably you know the right move ultimately long term for this team. So right. and obviously he seems. Um, to be relatively pleased with the trade, you know, I don't yeah. know necessarily, but he posted a picture on Instagram and yeah. all of that. So, yeah. um, you know, wish the Wenbergs all the best. They were always such a delight to mm -hmm. be around and to work with. So um, I think though that the Kraken will be okay. And I also have full faith in general manager, Ron Francis. I don't mm -hmm. think he would have made that move if he didn't think <laughs> that they were going to be okay. Right. So Well, and, and depth is a good point. I mean, we saw unfortunately quite a few injuries this year for the team mm -hmm. and, and I never felt like it got to the point where we didn't have somebody that we could rely on. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think you're correct in that, you know, this isn't, this isn't an alarming thing, mm -hmm. um, but it'd be interesting to see uh, who Ron picks up in, in the off season, mm -hmm. maybe to I supplement agree. or, uh, yeah. you know, we got a lot of draft picks now, which is nice. Mm -hmm. I said it when the trade happened, um, but I do think it's also important to to say again is that the reason for the Alex Wenberg trade is that it was pretty clear that the two could not come together and agree on a contract extension. Mm -hmm. And Wenberg's contract is up after this year. Right. And if you could not come to an agreement, for mm -hmm. lack of a better phrase, come the summertime, he's walking Free. For nothing. Correct. And you're not getting anything in return. Correct. So while I think in the short term, are you better off with Alex Weinberg? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For all the reasons you had said, Piper. Correct. But for the future of the Kraken, to be able to get a second round pick mm -hmm. and a third round pick for him, I think is a great bit of business by general manager Ron Francis and his staff to be able to help this team in the future. So I thought it was a good move. And to have Jared McCann, who was the guy that you brought up, who I'm going to ask you about now, has come in and just done such a nice job um, in the scoring aspect for him. Right now, currently sitting on 27 goals. Mm -hmm. He had 40 last year. I don't think there's any reason why he couldn't go on a tear, maybe get back to 40. I think for sure he's going to get to 35. What impresses you so much about his ability to score? And plus, I feel like he always seems to be a pretty good interview and tell you ex pretty much how he feels mm -hmm. and be I, honest. I do agree with that. And, you know, this isn't directly an answer to your question, but I think it is absolutely, it relates, is that I think Jared McCann has truly finally found a home in the NHL mm. with the Seattle Kraken. Right. And, you know, his, his career has been a little bit tumultuous in terms of the teams he's played for and kind of how he's how he feels he's been perceived in the different markets and all of that that he's been in. But I think that he actually feels truly happy and comfortable here. And I also think that that is why he is more than confident and more than willing to go out and play in these different situations. He obviously has the skill, but as you know, a lot of hockey is also about your confidence and about your mindset and your your grit and your will to to commit to playing in those situations and all of that. And I just think that he has been the perfect example for this team of doing that, no matter what it is. He's like, yep, I will do that and I will truly give it my best. And that is one of the things that impresses me about Jared McCann and that I admire about Jared McCann beyond his sickening shot and all of the <laughs> other things that he that he brings to this team. Um, you know, okay, then to now get full circle to answer your question, mm -hmm. yes, I think he can absolutely get to 35 goals, which also when you look at how the team was winning last year compared to this year, you know, it's one of those moments where he had, you know, 40 last year. It's one of those moments where 
this is kind of the moment that they really need the Jared McCanns of their team to also step up mm -hmm. and to be clutch in those times. And I think that we've seen that from both him and Oliver Bjorkstrand. We've we've seen other guys definitely contributing lately as well. You know, finally, Andre Burakovsky got on the board. That's yep. a good one for the group. That's a good one for him. Good for the room. Um, but I, I truly think, like, Jared McCann is their guy, mm -hmm. like, in, in terms of just, like, the heart and soul of kind of what being a Kraken really means to me. I absolutely think he embodies that. Two things before we wrap up. Jordan Eberle is set to play game 1000 against mm -hmm. the Vegas Golden Knights on March 12th. He's been here from the beginning. You have <laughs> been here from the beginning. So you've seen everything that's gone on and how important he has been, not just on the ice, but in the room mm -hmm. and to the young guys and in the community. When you think about him playing 1000 and his career as a crack and what comes to mind? It is unbelievable. Like covering Jordan Eberle is one of the kind of pinch me moments because I grew up such a hockey fan. I remember when he scored the golden goal for Team mm. Canada in the World <laughs> Juniors tournament. Yep. So does Jake. Like my husband Jake loved Jordan Eberle, you know, and it's funny, you know, when, when Hayden Fleury was on the team way back when and I, I did a two minute minor with him, I asked him who his favorite player was growing up and he was like, Jordan Eberle, mm -hmm. always my favorite player growing wow. up. And there's several guys that have said that over the years. So I think that alone speaks to just like how iconic he kind of is in yeah. this league, but also he is such a professional. He is very professional. You know, hockey is his passion and, you know, his lifeblood a hundred percent. And he has the skills and the resume to prove it. That's what a thousand games, you know, represents. But uh, to your point, he's also just like, he's such a leader and such yeah. a, a motivating factor and an inspiration for this room. And that's also kind of why I have a feeling that hopefully for a thousand games, the team will show their respect for him by bringing their best as well. Mm -hmm. I don't doubt that at all for what he, for what he means to the team. And Piper, lastly, I, I wanted to give you some time to talk about the Kraken fans and what they mean to you and, and how cool and special, and I'll leave it up to you in your words, but um, to be part of the team, to be part of Rudin, to be part of the hockey culture here in Seattle. Um, what comes to mind and um, and how cool is it for you to be involved with the with the Kraken fans on social media and in person when you have people taking pictures of you when you're on the bench doing the pregame interview and, and all of the interaction that you get to have? It is so cool. I know that that is just like such a baseline thing, but it's also so cool to see how hockey fans in the Pacific Northwest have really come into their own identity. Like I really feel like our fans are similar in a lot of ways, but different in a lot of ways too, to other fan bases. Um, and I also think part of that is just kind of because of the identity of of us, of Seattle being such a, you know, kind of a melting pot. Like there's people from all different kind of backgrounds, a lot of transplants, as you said earlier, Grant, um, just all, all of that. Uh, it makes it such an interesting, it's like this tech focus, but there's a lot of like old school hockey fans. I, I swear I get followers on Twitter and their bios are like bass player, lover of rock and roll, <laughs> data scientist, you know, like yeah. it's just like this whole, like it's like this tech rock and roll hockey mixture kind of, but yeah. it's also um, it, it to walk around KCI and see the kids here who are learning this game, maybe for the first time, a lot of them for the first time, it blows my mind and the fact that like i said i've been here since day one like i was at that expansion draft hosting it and to see actually how people have really dug in and celebrated it like i don't even have words for just how cool it is to see this truly unique identity of a hockey fan base bloom and grow and i and i just think it's going to keep growing because of how special it is. And I think that people see how special it is where even if they're not super into hockey yet, they're like, well, that seems like a pretty cool community that I could be part of. I love it. And I know I speak for everybody when I say, as hockey continues to grow, your Piper are a huge reason why it is where it is and where it will continue to grow. So keep up the incredible work that you do in telling stories and, and being the communicator and the facilitator from the team to the masses. Thank you for coming on today and continued luck to you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for the kind words. This was fun. Thanks guys. Thanks. Signals from the Deep is the official podcast of the Seattle Kraken. Hosted by Nick Olchek and produced by me, Grant Beery. Have a question for Nick? 
Leave a voicemail on the Signals from the Deep hotline at 206-279-7810 or send an email to signals at seattlekraken.com. Your question could be featured on an upcoming episode. 